This video is made for entertainment and educational purposes only. All photographs that are modern in nature are to help describe our story in the video. The photographs are used under the Fair Use Clause of the 1976 Copyright Act. While we talk about the turbulent history of Kentucky and Tennessee with the tobacco wars, we are in no way advocating for the use of tobacco and tobacco products. As with all of our stories, we try to give all sides to the story and let you, our viewers and readers, make up your own minds as to the facts of what happened during the tobacco wars. The 35 counties involved in the Black Patch are in southwestern Kentucky and northwestern Tennessee. This area is called the Black Patch because it is the main supplier for dark fired tobacco. Dark fired tobacco is used in snuff, chewing tobacco, and pipe tobacco. During the years of 1904 through 1909, there was great civil unrest in the tobacco fields of Kentucky and Tennessee. In part one, we will discover the players and the circumstances that led to the buildup of the tobacco wars. This was actually a three-sided war between the American Tobacco Company, or the ATC, owned by James B. Duke, the Dark Tobacco District Planters Protective Association, or the PPA, of Kentucky, and the Dark Tobacco District Planters Protection Association, PPA, of Tennessee. Who was James Buchanan Buck Duke? Born on December 23, 1856, in Durham, North Carolina, to George Washington Duke and his second wife, Artelia Rodney Duke. James had two half-siblings by the name of Sidney Taylor Duke and Brody Leonidas Duke and two full siblings by the names of Mary Elizabeth Duke Lyon and Benjamin Newton Duke. James would marry Lillian Fletcher McCready, also known as Lillian Nanette Duke, in 1904, and they would divorce in 1906 and had no children. Duke would marry Nataline Lee Holt in 1907. He would have a daughter by the name of Doris Duke with Nataline, who was born November 22, 1912. An ambitious North Carolina businessman and planter, James Buchanan Buck Duke, figured out that he could make more money by buying and selling tobacco rather than growing it himself. With this knowledge, Duke established the W. Duke Sons and Company in 1879 to produce tobacco and cigarettes, the automated cigarette rolling machine. In 1881, John Bosack invented the commercial cigarette rolling machine. Duke quickly obtained a license to use the first automated pre-rolled tobacco machine. Duke purchased the two machines and was able to produce 400 cigarettes in a minute. In 1884, Duke struck a deal with Bonsack to use his machines exclusively in exchange for lower royalties. This allowed Duke to drop his prices and the other companies could not compete in the market. At this time, Duke would hold 40% of the cigarette market in the United States. The American Tobacco Company In 1890, Duke was able to consolidate with the other companies to form the American Tobacco Company and would gain control of 90% of the tobacco market. By 1900, the ATC had complete control of the American tobacco market. Because of this control, Duke was able to reduce tobacco buying price, thus causing many farmers to go into bankruptcies and lose their farms. These Robin Baron tactics of Duke's is the spark that started the tobacco wars. Who was Felix Grundy Ewing? On August 8, 1858, Felix Grundy Ewing was born in Nashville, Tennessee, to John Overton and Sally Bass Ewing. John was the treasurer of a railroad company and a farmer. Sometime before 1904, Felix moved to Adams, Kentucky, near the Kentucky-Tennessee state line, and bought the Glen Raven Plantation. Felix Ewing was a successful, wealthy tobacco planter and had turned Glen Raven Plantation into a company town, complete with a church, stores, post office, and homes for its sharecroppers and tenant farmers. Tired of getting deflated prices for the product, 
often not meeting the cost of planting and harvesting the tobacco, and wanting control over the sale of their own crops, the farmers began to come together. Because of the lower prices that Ewing was getting for his tobacco, and the fact that many people working for him had started to defect to cotton growing plantations, he came up with a plan. The Dark Tobacco District Planters Protective Association of Kentucky and Tennessee. The first thing Ewing did was hold a meeting of 5,000 residents of the area on September 24, 1904 in Guthrie, Kentucky. His idea was for all farmers to place their tobacco with the association to be held until the asking price for the tobacco was reached. The Dark Tobacco District Planters Protective Association of Kentucky and Tennessee was formed and officers were elected and a charter was drawn up and approved. This was such a good idea that the membership numbers began to soar and included judges, farmers, businessmen, prosecutors, and law enforcement officers. However, this group of people did cause added tensions to the area, and the spark was ignited that started the unrest and violence in the area. Membership Drives One of the articles that was placed in the charter was that each member of the PPA would use their influence to get other farmers to join with the collective. Many farmers were opposed to this idea and refused to join. Those that did not join were given the name, quote, hillbillies, unquote. Now, being an Appalachian hillbilly myself, the term is not often seen as derogatory. However, in this context, my apologies to my fellow hill folks, but that is what they called those that would not join their association. As the tensions between the members and the non-members grew, it eventually escalated to violence to convince others to join the growing group. By 1905, the conditions began to worsen in the area. Members began to withdraw from the PPA. There was no peaceful resolution as the farmers had hoped that there would be. As the group began to gain membership, more radical people began to grab power in the group as Ewing himself became ill. This led to the election of Dr. David Amos from Cobb County, Kentucky. Through Dr. Amos's leadership, things would turn ugly and war was declared upon those that would not join the PPA. There is no early life record of Dr. David Amos available at this time. In our next video, we will discuss the Silent Brigades and the Night Raiders. As this section of history and the tobacco wars begin to heat up and become more angry. As we talk about this time in history, we are simply showing a light on the time of civil unrest in American history and how it has affected Kentucky and Tennessee. As the PPA became more radicalized, splinter groups began to form and started wreaking havoc upon the Black Patch tobacco area of the states. Come along with us as we walk through the terrifying night raids of 1904 through 1909. Dr. David Alfred Amos or Amos. Dr. Amos in 1889 began to get involved in violent incidents in Western Kentucky. He began taking part in the quote, violent enforcement of morality, unquote. In the 1900s, Amos began attending the PPA meetings. He slowly found other radical people within the group who wanted to take vengeance and act violently to get things accomplished. The splinter group began holding secret meetings. Blood oaths and secrecy helped to secure everyone's loyalty to the insider group. Possum Hunters The first splinter group from the PPA was the Possum Hunters. 32 members of the PPA met in Stainback Schoolhouse in northern part of Robertson County, Tennessee in October of 1905. The group adopted the resolution of the Committee of the Possum Hunters Organization and outlined their grievances against the Trust and the Hillbillies. In a statement of the resolution, it read, quote, be it further proclaimed to the world that any farmer or persons who aid the trust in any way by selling to it their tobacco at a higher price is an accomplice of the trust and is in good morals as guilty as the trust, unquote. 
there was also a public statement that was published in leaflet form and passed around to the farms that read, quote, Old fool, raise no tobacco. Notice, old fool, dare to raise a stalk of tobacco on your land or assist anyone else in raising, and ye shall pay the penalty with your home and life. So ye be warned, the night Riders, unquote. They resolved to visit the trust and those that refused to join the group in numbers ranging from no less than five and more than 2,000 persons using peaceful methods. At first, their methods were stern lectures, but it soon escalated into violent methods. The main object of the group was to intimidate and coerce others into joining the PPA. The idea quickly caught on and several possum hunter groups began to spring up in the area. They would meet under secrecy and under the cover of darkness in schoolhouses, country churches, and wooded areas. The Night Riders Amos began using his former experience as a cadet and drill master at the Major Farrell's Military School in Hopkinsville, Kentucky to perform paramilitary insurgents. The men began wearing masks, hoods, and robes, and began covering their mounts' hooves with cloths to go undetected during their raids. By 1906, they reached an estimated 10,000 members for these raids. Calling themselves the Silent Brigade as they would ride silently to the houses of their mark. They would beat up and scourge those who were non-compliant to the PPA, officials, and trust employees. They would burn down tobacco barns and fields. They would ruin fields by planting grass seed, plowing up the ground, or by throwing salt on the earth. The night raiders would also burn down the houses of the people who would not cooperate with the PPA. The First Raid On December 1, 1906, several members of the PPA drifted into Princeton, Kentucky, the county seat of Caldwell County. Before the destruction began, several men quietly occupied the police and fire stations and seized the telegraph and telephone offices and shut down the city water supply. As darkness fell, the town went to sleep for the night. Two hundred robe and masked men rode into the town. As they shot off their guns, the townspeople began to awaken and turn on the house lights and come out to see what the disturbance was. They were immediately told to go back inside and turn off their lights, to which their windows and doors were smashed and broken. Some of the men went out into the tobacco fields and would either trample the fields, salt them, or if they had porous canvas upon them to protect the shoots, they would douse them with kerosene and light them on fire. This would completely destroy the field for the season as it was too late for replanting. The raiders moved to the J. G. or tobacco factory and set the factory ablaze with kerosene and several sticks of dynamite placed for the total destruction of the building. The next building was the Steger and Dollar Warehouse to be set ablaze. That night, both buildings were completely destroyed along with 75 tons of non-PPA tobacco. Buck Duke's Response and Woes the PPA was impeding Duke's business and the flow of tobacco was slowing down. His immediate thoughts upon the matter was that the associations were a group of men that were manipulated by outside people to subvert the American way of doing business. Compounded to the PPA and splinter group's attacks on the tobacco crops was the new president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt just held a successful campaign of rabble-rousing and trust-busting promises. These promises reawakened the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act. This legislation prohibited the anti-competitive business practices of Duke and other robber barons such as Rockefeller, Carnegie, Ford, and others. The People's Response the people loved the improvements to their lives that the actions of the PPA were making. They had more money to buy food, pay off their mortgages, and buy clothing. As the pro-trust warehouses were being burned down, the price of tobacco was going up and helping the smaller farmers. The Second Raid 
As the Princeton raid began to spread quickly, Hopkinsville, Kentucky began to brace itself for the next raid. The citizens began to heavily arm themselves and the state militia stationed themselves in the city. Hopkinsville held two of the largest Duke Trust warehouses in the state. This made Hopkinsville a very tempting target for the Knot Raiders. On the night of January 4, 1907, Mayor Charles Mayhem received a telephone call that night that the Raiders were on their way. The call went out to all the citizens and they sat prepared for the raid that did not come that night. The hoax was a test to see if Hopkinsville was at the ready for an impending raid. Over the year, many of the raiders would drift in and out of town to see if the town was still ready to defend themselves. Several times, the raiders would come to the city limits and would turn back as the alarm was sounded of their presence. On December 7, 1907, the Silent Brigade attacked Hopkinsville, Kentucky. They left their horses behind them as the 250 masked and robed men marched into town with military precision. Each time a light would turn on and a window would be shot out. The men guarded the entrances and exits of the city, seized the police and fire stations, captured the l &N Rail Depot, and took over the telephone and telegraph offices. Several people were taken as hostages and put into a makeshift corral on Main Street. Several businesses were destroyed and vandalized, as well as the newspaper office. Lindsay Mitches, who was a buyer for a local tobacco company, was dragged out of his home and severely beaten and scourged. The Latham Warehouse and the Tandy and Fairley Warehouses were burned, which caused several private residences to burn as well. There were two injuries. J.C. Feltz, a brakeman for the railroad, was shot in the back but survived, and Dr. Amos was shot in the head by one of his men and removed for treatment. When the raid was breaking up, Major Bassett, a commander for the militia, escaped out of the back of his house, gathered 11 men, and mingled with the raiders. As they followed them out of town, a gunfight ensued and killed one man and wounded another. The Election of Kentucky Governor Augustus E. Wilson Feeling like they had accomplished their goals, the groups began to break up and go back to their farms to till their crops. However, this changed with the election of Wilson. He was a Republican attorney and a firm friend of big business. Many did not like him in the state of Kentucky at that time for his corpulent leanings and for his being from the city of Louisville, the only metropolitan area in the state. As a result of the PPA actions, the Kentucky Governor, Augustus E. Wilson, ordered that the militia remain on active duty from December 1907 through November 1908. There were no active raids where the militia was stationed. The Russellville and Eddyville Raids Several raids went on in the city of Russellville, Kentucky. This was because the militia was busy guarding the Hopkinsville and other larger cities. The level of preparedness made the larger cities less of a tempting target. However, the PPA would not give up on its raids and found easier places to leave their mark. The first raid happened on January 3, 1908. Using the same methods as before, the raiders captured the towns of Dykesburg, View, and Eddyville, Kentucky, and burned down the Luckett Wake Tobacco Company and the American Snuff Company. There were several attacks on the citizens over the months, and the violence escalated. Many people were beaten and bloody in their wake. It was not until January 17th that the soldiers made it into these areas to help. The PPA Attracts Criminals when you have a group of men who are willing to resort to violence to prove a point, it is inevitable that the criminal element will soon get involved. As the more successful the raids became, brawlers, bigots, criminals, and the worst sort of men soon signed to be part of the night raiders. Soon the men began taking out their own vengeances and settling their own scores. They would organize into small mobs to exact their own form of law and order such as a case that happened in Russellville, Kentucky. 
The second raid happened on August the 1st, 1908. 100 men seized the jail in Russellville, Kentucky, and seized four African-American men. Their names were Joseph Riley and Virgil, Robert, and Thomas Jones. They were local sharecroppers and friends with Rufus Browder, who was also a sharecropper. Browder had an altercation with a landowner by the name of James Cunningham. The story goes that the altercation escalated when Cunningham scourged Browder. As Browder turned to walk away from the situation, Cunningham shot Browder. Browder turned and returned fire, killing Cunningham in self-defense. All of the men were in the jail over the confrontation. Browder was moved to another town jail for his own protection. The other four men were innocent, but they had supported Browder and were vocal about their discontent of their employers and were in the jail for those reasons. These men were dragged out of the jail and then taken to a tree and executed by the raiders. The Crittenden County Raids The first raid happened on February 4, 1908. Doing the same methods that had worked before, the town of Dykesburg, Kentucky was overtaken. W.B. Groves and Henry Bennett were dragged from their homes and severely scourged for refusing to join the PPA. The second raid happened on February 10, 1908, when the raiders took over the towns of Mexico and Fredona, Kentucky. The farm of former candidate for governor A.H. Cardin was raided and had two of his tobacco barns burned. The Birmingham, Kentucky Raid on the night of April 9, 1908, the Night Raiders went into the mostly African-American town of Birmingham, Kentucky. The reason was that the community was still working for non-PPA member farms, and they wanted them to move on from working there. While shooting in the houses, African-American John Scruggs and his young grandson were shot and killed by the same round of fire. Several of the community were held down and severely beaten and scourged during the raid. Duke in Court and Tobacco Prices The New York Court of Appeals in late 1908 ruled that Duke Trust was in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Under this act, the American Tobacco Company had to be fragmented into different entities under different ownerships. This was appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Tobacco prices began to stabilize around the country, causing an end to most of the violence. However, there was still dispute among the political figures and the law enforcement over those that wanted law and order and those that supported the night raiders. We began the arrest and trials of the night raiders and possum hunters. In the last part, we saw how the tobacco farmers felt anger and held grievances against James P. Duke and his American Tobacco Company for unfair business practices. Duke consolidated the tobacco companies into one company called the American Tobacco Company. Using this huge conglomerate, Duke was able to drive down the buying prices for tobacco which left many farmers in poverty and bankruptcy. Not taking this lying down, the remaining farmers then consolidated into the Planters Protective Association of Kentucky and Tennessee. As we have seen, the PPA had their own issues, as they would use scare tactics, scourging, murder, and burning down personal and company property to make their voices heard. They temporarily captured entire towns which included three county seats in Kentucky. The governor of Kentucky, Augustus E. Wilson, would step in and order the Kentucky National Guard to start protecting the county seat citizens from further harassment. Although this did keep the county seat safe, it took a while to rein in the rest of the townships and gain control of the Black Patch tobacco area. Duke did not go unscathed in all of this. He not only had to face the wrath of the farmers when they organized into the PPA of Kentucky and Tennessee, but he would also go on to face the Supreme Court for monopoly charges. Come with us as the Blind Lady of Justice will now have her time in this saga. The End of the War Lieutenant Newton Jasper Wilson led Kentucky State Guard detachment against the Night Raiders in April of 1908. Several men were arrested and several key informants were protected. 
One of the protected informants was Macon Champion, who was a former night raider. Champion would implicate 15 other local farmers in connection with the raids. Most of the men were not convicted at the trial, but it effectively ended the Black Patch War. Because of the arrests that Wilburn had made, he was promoted from lieutenant to captain. Marshall County investigates the Birmingham Night Raid. Marshall County authorities did an investigation, and Burnett Phelps was the first raider to be brought to trial. African American victims were encouraged to sue for damages. By December 1908, two more men confessed to being lesser leaders in the raid and turned state's evidence. One of the men, Ed Fox, regretted his participation in the crime. Filled with remorse, he tried to use a pistol. His wife discovered him, and fighting for the firearm, Fox was shot in the stomach and it killed him a few days later. The other witness also died by his own hand before he testified. The raiders of Lyon County tried to intimidate the judge in the case and even conducted a raid on the town of Benton where the trial was being held. This outraged the authorities who sought justice for the death of John Scruggs and his grandson. Dr. Amelius Champion of Lyon County was indicted for the murders and would serve a year in the Eddyville, Kentucky State Penitentiary. Seventy-two defendants would go to trial for damages. An award of $25,000 in damages was given to L.A. Baker and school teacher Nat Frizzell, a share of which came from each of the defendants in the case. Both cases took only five minutes for the jury to return a verdict. Dr. Amos Goes to Trial After the arrest of Dr. Amos, trial was set to begin in February of 1910. Dr. Amos did face trial in Christian County, according to the March 11, 1911 Hopkinsville, Kentuckian. Amos and several others would face off in front of Circuit Judge John T. Hanbury. One of the main witnesses against Amos was former night raider Milton Oliver. As the testimony wore on, one of the key witnesses, Milton Oliver, was shot in the left hip while standing in his front yard on May 25, 1910. The trial was postponed until the following year so that Oliver could recover from his injuries and finish his testimony. In the middle of June 1910, Amos was indicted on violation of the Ku Klux Law, which stated that a group of people could not be armed and disguised for purposes of alarming or intimidating others. Oliver was asked the same questions over and over again by Judge Bush until the court ruled out repetitions. Oliver confessed that he had been forced to sign false statements to save his life, and even that did not protect him from assassination attempt. Several more witnesses came forward to point to Dr. Amos as the ringleader for the Hopkinsville Raid of 1907. The trial would last from March 8th through March 16th, 1911. Amos would claim that he had an alibi during the Hopkinsville raid. He claimed that he was called to the house of William H. White as his wife was very sick and needed help of a doctor. All attempts to disprove this alibi proved fruitless as well as Wally Jones, White's son-in-law, avoided answering the summons. However, Amos was acquitted of all charges in March of 1911. He moved to New York City to practice medicine with his son until his death in 1915. Death of Axum Cooper One of the witnesses for the state was Axum Cooper. In the middle of the Amos trial, Axum Cooper was shot to death at Tom Litchfield's barbecue on July 30, 1910. Night Raiders Roy Merrick and Vilas Mitchell, as well as six other men, stood trial for the deed in two separate trials of four men each. Because Commonwealth Attorney Denny P. Smith and Colonel E.B. Bassett felt that the jury was stacked unfairly, another jury from Cotton County was summoned. After all of the testimony, the eight men were acquitted. Morgantown, Kentucky Trials The trials did not end with Dr. Amos. According to the Hartford Herald, April 7, 1915, in Morgantown, Kentucky, evidence was being heard about the Possum Hunters organization. According to the testimony of a county official, 
that the possum hunters in that last fall had a membership of over 500 members in that section and that 80 percent were possum hunters they also said that they were not afraid of courts of law the same man further said that quote if Judge Moss and Prosecutor Gillum came down here and tried to bother them, the possum hunters would make them swim Green River back faster than the boat that brought them down there, unquote. A further threat was made when it was declared by witnesses that the band intended to blow Morgantown off the hill if they were interfered with. Because of the threats that the possum hunters had made, the trial was being transferred to Warren County. It is unknown how this trial ended. The Hartford, Kentucky Trials These trials did not go off smoothly. According to the Daily Gate City on August 25, 1915 in Hartford, Kentucky, evidence would be given in the case against the Possum Hunters organization for threats made to intimidate witnesses. Those witnesses were prepared to give evidence to the state. Because of the threat level, Centertown became a garrison on the third floor of a brick building where the four former members of the organization were being held surrounded by men with rifles. Those opposed to the possum hunters or who had just been marked by the organization for punishment walked around town armed for several months. Because of this fact, the members of the group backed down. Eighty-six alleged members were indicted. The possum hunters were still holding meetings at night and instituted their own court of justice. Punishment included floggings and other methods to those that owed membership debts, displeased them in business transactions, or refused to obey their methods of regulating the community. Two more confessions and convictions. According to the Daily Gate City on August 25, 1915 in Hartford, Kentucky, Jerry Clark and his son-in-law, Edward Tensioner, both confessed to being part of the Possum Hunter organization. They also admitted that they were part of a gang that terrorized the section of Kentucky. They blamed their actions on the Consolidated Tobacco Growers Association. They were sentenced to serve two years in the prison. Monopoly Challenge and Other Aftermath the American Tobacco Company was ordered to dismantle by the United States Supreme Court in 1911. In the case of United States v. American Tobacco Company, the court ruled that the ATC was a monopoly and it was in clear violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. By 1910, the war had ended except for some minor raids that happened in a few episodes. The tobacco farmers were now receiving more money for their crops and an overall peace settled over the area once again. James Buchanan, Buck Duke, would go on to establish the Duke Endowment that would give 40 million trust fund dollars, equivalent to 632 million in 2021, to the school for a medical school, teaching hospital, and nurses dormitory on the Durham campus. Trinity College would be renamed to Duke University in his honor. The James B. Duke Library on the main campus of Furman University was also named after him. According to the codicil of his will, Duke would add another $67 million, equivalent to $1.4 billion in 2021, to the Duke Endowment. While there were some convictions for the turbulent time in Kentucky and Tennessee during the Tobacco Wars, there were just as many acquittals. Was justice truly carried out for the victims? Only history can say for certain. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for supporting us as we bring to you the history of Kentucky and Tennessee.